my name is Rachel Fabel. I'm a pop surreal artist living on the Gold Coast. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the concepts in my work, the materials that I use and some of the processes. So firstly I'm going to take on a very small tour of my studio. So over here we have my desk where I do a lot of my sculpture work as well as my drawing and planning. Coming across this way and then over on this side is where I do all my painting. So at the moment I've got a painting on the go, just started on the background the other day and then it's a work that I completed not long ago. I'd firstly describe my work as whimsical contemplative and otherworldly. Firstly, I draw a lot of my inspiration from my childhood memories. So when I grew up in the country, I uh, also tend to draw inspiration during my years at university. So I studied an illustration degree. And during that time, I focused on fairy tales from different cultures. So I um, became really interested in Chinese um, mythology as well and just looking at how those, uh, the morals that come through those fairy tales and the storytelling is very important in my work. Uh, I'm also looking constantly at Pinterest and Instagram. So um, it's just a good way if you're a bit brain dead to basically get some great ideas. I constantly are drawing from many different places um, to form uh, the ideas for my work. I'd say the main artistic influences um, obviously are within my genre of painting, so pop surrealist. So some of the beginning or the first artists from that genre would be Mark Ryden. Uh, also love Joe Soren's work. Um, which is a lot looser than my work, but um, fits within that same genre. Uh, and since then, I've looked at a lot of American pop surrealists as well, such as Mab Graves. Um, and I love Australian artist Courtney Brin. She does a lot of sort of um, animals, um, looking at in, in sort of expressing them in a very surreal manner. Um, Richard Oliver, he's an amazing painter, so constantly looking at his painting style. And um, Ju Plus, she's great as well, does some really like fine uh, work with lace as well, which I've recently been inspired by. But um, most recently I've really looked at the Renaissance period and um, their use of chiaroscuro, which is looking at that light and darkness in an artwork, as well as a lot of surreal photographers. So I'm using a lot of photography references in my own paintings, even though they're highly stylized. So I'd say central to every fairy tale um, is this idea of a central message or moral that's being communicated, whether that's a disrespect for nature, whether that's, um, you know, looking at people being dishonest and the consequences of dishonest, dishonesty. So last year I had my um, first international solo show called uh, Out of the Velvet Blackness. And I drew from many different fairy tales. So I looked at um, The Little Prince, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Jack and the Beanstalk in my work, and looked at how um, there is a, I suppose, a degradation or demise in childhood Im imagination that happens as they tend to grow older and how we have this adversity to thinking that we're not creative. So we, so I sort of looked at that as a central message using these fairy tales as a way to sort of say, hey, everyone's creative. They just uh, need to believe in the ability that they are a creative being. And um, that even though adults have a sense of logic, there's something really unique and special about uh, childhood and their ability to be imaginative.
my current body of work I'm looking at very much as a bushland series so I suppose just before we had those big bushfires in Australia I became more interested in the unique creatures of Australia and looking at some of those rarer animals that we don't know so um, the jaboa is one of those um, the bush stone curlew, these really unusual sorts of creatures um, and just feeling a strong connection to uh, the uniqueness of this land because uh, when I was a kid I actually grew up in the Warrumbungle National Area, National Park, not in the park but um, I lived in a town very close to there and we spent a lot of time going on bushwalks We'd spend uh, a lot of time sort of, you know, around campfires and go exploring and hanging out in trees and going to watering holes with my friends. So I suppose a lot of that of my past is coming back into my artwork now. Um, I think I'm also very much drawn to the idea of creatures as well and looking at animals more so. Like even though I've got my big eyed characters, uh, my most one of my most recent works which was you know the huge sugar glider uh, really fascinated with giving them a personality and my next work that I'm working on at the moment is a huge barn owl so really looking at, at the animals themselves uh, and the reason for, for doing that is to to for, I suppose bring more interest into um, taking care of, of the animals that we do have on the planet uh, I also want to show you one of the things I've been working on. So I'll have to bring it over to the camera, I think. Alright, so all right, so this is one of them little guys. So I'm doing these ones I've been working on recently and then my little ceramic series. Okay. Um, they're called my sleeplings. So my very recent sculptures with all this COVID um, craziness that's going on uh, and all the, the stress that's been induced from the media, I really want to focus on a really quiet, um, calm place in my art making. So I've been creating these little um, sleeping little wool hangings. Uh, and they're sort of focusing on this idea of, of dreaming but also a sense of peace as well so I'm going to be creating a few more of those little sculptures as well um, in the future. I wouldn't say there's a kinship to any specific animal, I would say it's more to do with looking at unusual animals so as I said before um, the bushstone curlew and the uh, quokka and the pygmy jaboas um, are such fascinating little creatures like over on this particular work over here, um, this section here, um, basically looking at there are some examples of the, the jaboas and they're just sort of quirky strange looking creatures and I suppose I'm always drawn to that and that sort of you know, relates to my figures. They're all slightly quirky as well with the big eyes. So um, in terms of that question, not necessarily to a particular animal, but just for rare animals, I, I didn't really want to look at, you know, the the really iconic kangaroo and the wombat and, and those sorts of animals. I wanted to look at the more um, undiscovered ones so that people who aren't living in Australia realize well we're not just about those few animals there's a lot more to uh, the Australian wildlife than than what they're seeing. So my preferred mediums which I'm going to go through we're going to look at different sections of my studio just so that you understand there's, there's quite a few different things. All right, so some of the things that I use is what we call a, a UPO translucent paper. So this is like a plastic paper that I use for my drawings. And the translucent one's great because you can actually draw on both sides of the paper and it comes through. Uh, it's a lot softer, but it is harder to work with. 
So these are some of my drawings that I work with. Like so. so I've actually worked on both sides of these drawings. So I call it colour on the back and front. And these are mediums that I like to use. So I used to like uh, they're basically alcohol markers, the brush markers by Winsor & Newton. And they're great because they've got two tips on them here. And then a fatter end, which is great. I use a technical pencil for shading, although I wouldn't recommend that to my students at school because it's not so easy to use, but I've sort of got used to using them. And I use a paper stump as well. So I do all my shading with my paper stump, which is great. Uh, the other things that I use, so for my clay work, which I was showing you before, these pieces. So I use a paper clay. It's a little bit more forgiving um, than some other clays, which are finer. I find they tend to work really well. The other thing, which is a great device to use if you can afford it, is the iPad Pro. So I do a lot of my drawings. Oh, hello. It's a picture of me. Okay, so I do a lot of my sketches straight onto here and that was another question that came through was um, what's your process? So I start, obviously I start researching first what I'm going to do, find a whole lot of images on Pinterest um, and then from there I'll do my sketches onto my iPad. I used to use an art journal but not so much anymore for time saving so this is great because I can crop things out and add more space, um, I can duplicate and do s several different versions. So I've got ones here where I'm alternating where things are placed, which is really good. And then I'll transfer that up onto a larger canvas using the old overhead projector, um, which is great, very time saving. And then I'll start working through the process of painting from there. So another one of my things that I, materials that I use is the Windsor and Newton Artisan Water Mixable Oil Color. Okay, so these are great. So I don't, I used to use acrylics, but I found because I've got young kin, kids and I have to often come back and do a lot of the painting later or a day later, I don't want it to dry out so quickly and I'll be working on a large scale and only get through half of it. So I find uh, they're great because they work like an oil paint, but, um, they're not as messy or toxic. You don't have to use um, mediums with them. You can just use water. They can wash out in water rather than using terps, which is fantastic. So that's the only sort of paint that I use now when I'm doing my oil paintings. So I only use about five or six different colors and then I mix them all from here. So the ones that I'm using is my dioxide purple, my cadmium red, I've got a burnt sienna that I use, and I have my cadmium yellow, cerulean blue is my, one of my favourites, and then this one here is my, um, I think it's sap green, yes, sap green, the one like that. So I do all my colours, I might add a cooler red into the mix sometimes but generally those five or six colors that my staples for all the paintings that I do. So one of the tips I would say for people is that you need to work back to front so and I'm looking at my painting here and I'm just starting on at the moment yeah so I just block in that, that dark area there and then I'll start working, um, I suppose, the background of the bird and then I'll start adding details on top of that. So I usually give at least one coat and then I'll always work from the background to the foreground um, and overlap my colours when I do that in my, my shapes. Right, so... What I tend to do is I do a lot of my blending, what they call a comb or a rake. So it looks a bit like this, okay? It's got a really fine head on the end. I have a whole range of sizes of those ones. They're my favorite. 
Uh, and for big areas, I do have a big one of these as well. This is what we call a mop. So they're really, really uh, fine and great. It's almost like a makeup brush. Um, yeah, you can sort of rub that over and blend things really well. For really fine lines, obviously, I'll use um, a really, really tiny brush. I don't even know what the size of this is, but the, that's the size of brushes that I'm using for my fine, fine details. And they're all synthetic brushes. So with the type of paint that I'm using, that water-based oils, they work best with not natural head brushes, but they're synthetic. They tend to be softer um, and a little bit more kind in terms of uh, blending colors, which is a really important part for my, my work. Other things that I tend to use is that when I'm painting, I paint on linen as well. So I don't paint on canvas anymore. The reason why I paint on linen is because my, because my painting takes so long to create. Uh, often, you know, it makes it more, I suppose, um, timely. And I really want to make sure that the materials are the best possible materials I can use. So that's why I use a, a good quality paint and I use linen. Uh, to paint on. Uh, sometimes I find juggling family and art as well as because I'm an art teacher as well um, quite difficult to be honest. Um, my house is a little bit more messy than I would I'd really like it to be but I either sometimes at night time have to decide do I want to have a neat house or do I want to actually produce some artwork at night? So I need to make that decision and I just have variations of mess. Obviously I get to a point where, you know, I really need to clean up. But um, yeah, that's one of the things I put a little bit less pressure on myself to do that. The other thing is um, I realized I had to stop making comparisons about what I can achieve and what other people can achieve. So having a family and working five days a week as an art teacher um, I have less time than someone who's working full time on their art or who doesn't have children. So what I say to myself every day is that if I just produce something every day, whether it's small, if I work on my art, whether it's working on my website or um, writing an artist statement, it's something. And something is better than nothing. So I sort of just came to that conclusion that um, it needs to be more of a habit then something that's you know you should be pressuring yourself to do so yeah that's that's the mindset that i've sort of come to is that something is better than nothing you do a little bit every day and you will see an improvement over the time and not to give up but you know having kids is is great in that it gives me insight and also reminds me of my own childhood uh, and a lot of those experiences are important in my work. So having children myself, um, I think it's also important in, in terms of developing my art and my themes. So I hope you get a bit of an idea about uh, my art process today and who I am and, and the type of work I produce. Uh, and thanks for joining me today. Bye.